and all his fans have been a pop star, so I don't know which one of these can't step him down. Um, the aspect of being human that I'd like to talk about, or briefly just comment on, is, is that of being conscious. Now, I think that most of you in this room right now feel that you are conscious. If that's different from what I'm saying, uh, we can talk about it afterwards, and there are cures for it. Uh, <laughs> but it seems so natural to be conscious. And yet, if you were asked to explain what, what this consciousness is, or even in broad terms what it feels like, it's very difficult. But the question here is whether science has anything to say on, on this topic. And that question is very controversial. Uh, there will be some who say that science has absolutely nothing to do with the issues of consciousness. And others will say, oh yes, it's simple, it's like this. I think a young Australian philosopher by the name of... Uh, uh, Chalmers, David Chalmers, uh, kind of neatly put his finger on, on the problem, and I'd like to tell you about that. He said you can do as much science on the brain as you like, and indeed discover activities in the brain which are clearly reflected in, in consciousness. You tweak a few neurons here, and uh, the owner of those neurons sees the color blue. Stop tweaking them, the color blue goes. The color blue, the sensation of the color blue is definitely a, a part of one's consciousness. So what David Chalmers said was, yes, you can have the science which kind of hits into the correlations between what comes into consciousness and what happens at the physical level, but there is no science that tells you how the two link up. Well, he was totally wrong. <laughs> it's a very provocative thing to say, and I think it puts the problem on the table. But if you look carefully at his book, I've I, I forgotten the exact title of it, but he only wrote one book in 1996. It, towards the end of the book, he suggests that, yes, well, that link sort of reminds him of once having been a computer scientist, and that there may be something informational in that link. Well, indeed, I think nowadays one would argue that the answer does lie in something informational. And I don't know if any of you have been uh, at Aaron Sloman's talk earlier in your series. I think you'd have argued very hard about that. Now, let, let me say what informational actually means. And you may be wondering what an engineer like me is doing amongst all these intelligent people. But engineers do one thing which maybe philosophers don't do, or even scientists don't do. They try and understand things by building them and by modeling them. So if I were told, go away and build a conscious machine, would I be able to do it or not? I would say, yes, I would have a go. And the reason is this, very simple. What is an informational machine? An informational machine is not necessarily a computer. Uh, we think of computer, even the word machine sort of triggers the idea of this thing that's on one's desk and you press the button. That is not the archetypal, uh, the archetypal informational machine. The informational machine is something much simpler than a computer, although a computer is an informational machine. It's some machine, doesn't matter very much how it's made, it could be made of beer cans. Um, so a philosopher is very happy to talk about machines made of beer cans and they could be conscious as long as you understood what consciousness was. Okay. So it could be made in some way, but the important thing is that it must have a state. There must be some sort of state of little switches that is internal and private to that machine. And they're endless machines, things that fly airplanes, they are machines of that kind. They have an inner state which is influenced by informational input. It's the informational content of the input that matters, whether it comes through wires or through 
I don't know, peer count or whatever, hardly matters, but it's the information that it contains, and we now have been able to talk about the nature of information since Sharon's work in 1948, uh, which changes the state, changes this inner private thing of the machine. And it's this inner private thing which influences its actions. It may not take any action at all. And that's a problem, because when you observe the machine, you may not get any clues of what this inner state is all about. But such machines exist, and engineers are capable of designing them. And it's through that line of thought that one has to come to the conclusion that the human being is an informational machine. And that it's the nature of this state structure, this private state structure, which is at the bottom of what we call consciousness. It's a bit more complicated than that, because as we were talking uh, before coffee, there are elements of what constitutes that inner state, which never come into consciousness, and elements that do. But to a broad approximation, what we talk about when we talk about our consciousness is this private inner state. Okay. Now, I hope that... Um, well, let, let, let me just give you a little bit of evidence of what people have done by thinking that way. Um, the first thing that one has to do if one tries to model consciousness is to break it down. Consciousness is a big word, and it means a, a lot of different things. It means having a sensation of being somewhere. You, you have a sensation of being in the store and listening to the waffle and so on. Um, it uh, has to do with uh, imagination. You can imagine situations that you've never been in, but yet they might make sense or they might not make any sense at all. Uh, and uh, uh, people like J.K. Rowling make a lot of money out of it. So there is this imaginative character of consciousness. There are also other elements that we were talking about earlier, an emotional character, a planning character. Now, what an engineer will do is to break down this informational machine into these various things, and most of these things are actually uh, available to construction. I won't say any more about it. It's all in the literature, if you, if you want to be bored. And, uh, read it from cover to cover. Okay. Now, I hope that some of you are totally skeptical of what I've said. <laughs> because this is, the, the, the skepticism is that which makes one feel, hey, uh, this guy's talking about conscious machines and so on. He, he, he's talking nonsense. But, a very interesting question is, where does the skepticism come from? Why are we skeptical of machines that could possibly be conscious? And uh, the answer is, is a fairly simple one for me, because when I, when I read Aristotle, I discovered that in De Anima, there, there, was, uh, uh, there was a statement that things in the world are either living or not living, and it's only amongst living things that you can start discussing concepts. Well, he, he wouldn't have used the word consciousness, but certainly uh, something to do with mind and soul. And so if you come along with your informational machine, you're totally outside of that, and you've got nothing to say about it. But I think that if someone had given Aristotle a laptop for a present, <laughs> he might have realized that there was such a thing as a, an informational machine, and that might have solved some of it problems that have been with us for two and a half thousand years. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>